This meeting is being recorded. All right, we're in. Um, I loved it because, you know, again, being reminded of the same God, the God of Abraham, the God who parted the Red Sea and reminding us of his faithfulness despite change, okay? And what I was about to say was change really, let me tell y'all, change is definitely scary when you walk in and boom, somebody changes up on you. You walk in, boom, there's a new system. You walk in, boom, there's just a new something, right? But change really, in my opinion, because I know it feels like, man, change is crazy when you don't, you know, you don't have control and it just seems to come out of nowhere. Um, but change can be a little bit more scary when God is calling you to be the catalyst of that change. I'm like, oh, miss, uh-uh. You know, sometimes we are sitting back and we are praying, thank you, God. We are asking God for that new level, that new chapter, okay? And then he turns around and he says, okay, this is what I need you to do. <laughs> I looked at him the other day like, excuse, excuse me? <laughs> I don't, you, I thought you was just going to, you know, go ahead and handle it. <laughs> I thought you was going to just send, send your blessing. Just send it, Lord. Do it, Lord part the Red Sea. And sometimes he'll say, yeah, but you know, in this day and age, I need you to start, I need you to put that staff down in front of people and say that the, the sea is going to part. And you say, well, people are going to think I'm crazy and I don't even know where to begin. I don't even know how to even, you know, so that's when I feel change can get a little scary when God asks you to be the catalyst of that change. We start praying and asking and waiting and we don't realize that he's asking us to take the first step. And many times as we grow spiritually, and this is something that I've been dealing with in this season, just being completely transparent I look back on my life in the pattern and I've been telling them that I'm like, each time this is what you've done. So I'm waiting for you to do the same thing. And it wasn't until recently where he said, well, I'm not going to really do the same thing because you're older now. I said, wait, now what you, what you mean older now? Yeah, you've grown spiritually. So now I'm going to need you to take your faith walk to the next level. See, when I used to show up for you before, I would do it in a way where you could see me move and you just, now I need you to take, I need you to walk on water. To walk on water. You just used to always come and pick me up and make it work. So be mindful of that. As you grow and you you under your, your relationship with God grows, just like a, a parent with their child, he is not gonna just heat up your bottle and feed it to you. As you get older, he's gonna tell you where to go buy the steak. And you're like, I never went to go get the steak. You just always provided the steak and then I put the oven on 450 and I throw it in there and, you know? So he's like, I just want you to know, oh yeah, I'm still going to show up. I'm still going to blow your mind, but I need, I want you to be a part of this because I want you to know that you know that you know that it was me this time because I'm going to work through you. So transitioning into the actual message where that word change just kind of came out of nowhere for us for, um, you know, the, ch the, the title of this chapter is The Messy, Beautiful Power of Speaking the Truth in Love. Ooh, right? And so even when we think about change, and I'm really trying to let that word go, but he's screaming, you know, change. This, you know, someone in here needs to know it's, it's time and it's okay. And that I got you on the other end, but it's time to change. And I know that you're the catalyst, but God is there. He's he, even though he tells you to be the catalyst of change, he still goes before you. He's still God. He's still in control. He didn't say take control. He just said, I need you to take a step out, but I'm the one that's causing you to walk on water without me. You're going to take a step out and sink. Um, and when we think about this chapter, a lot of change, especially if you are in the middle of that, comes with having to speak the truth in love. And that is one of the hardest things we struggle with when we try to have healthy relationships, okay? We're receiving the truth in love <laughs> and speaking the truth in love. And I put down here some of us, and I can't even say some because I'm going to say for me... It just depends on the person. I call it the non-confrontational syndrome. Some of us just can't go there 
You know, some of some of us are very non-confrontational. And it is so important that we, as we get older, we recognize the importance of how our upbringing has affected us to communicate and to um, connect with people because it it has a large part of who you are. It doesn't mean that you need to go and get stuck in the past. It just needs, it helps you understand and if there are certain things that you can be delivered from. But some people are non-confrontational for many reasons. It could be because there was a fear of speaking, speaking your truth when you were younger. So now that you're older, it's just like, oh, I won't go there. And, and it gets to a point where it's like, you know, not only will I not go there, if I have something to say, I'm just going to have to leave because I ain't going to say it. I don't know how to say it. Some, and some of us struggle with, I hear it in my head, but when it comes out of my mouth, it doesn't, it doesn't come out good. <laughs> Right. I hear it in my head. And sometimes you let me know, you know what you have to do. You're just going to have to practice. It's just like if you had a big interview or something coming up or you're about to talk or you got to give a speech, you want to practice. It's just as important as we invest in relationships to sometimes practice speaking the truth in love. You can use a friend or a family member to say, look, tell me how this sounds. Because in my head and in my heart, I mean, well, and I want to say that you don't want to get to that place of speaking the truth in love until God releases you to do so. Some, sometimes God will say, you know, he, he's always like, be slow to speak. And you know, that is a huge struggle for me, man. That's I, I've got. I can't even talk about how much of a struggle it is. And and again, it goes with our personality background. Me, I am a huge communications person. That's what I majored in. I am here to talk to the people. So even in my relationships, I have to learn, girl, be quiet. I have to tell myself, you said too much. And I really don't realize that until I said too much. It's like, I got to get it out. Right. Um, and if God didn't ask me to say that, man, you just make things worse. But when God does give you the release to speak the truth in love, that means it's time. And she talked about her relationship um, with her daughter, her daughter. She actually adopted her daughter um, at the uh, her daughter was 20 years old when she adopted her. So she adopted a, a young adult, you know, at the age she was, she, she was 20 years old when she adopted her, not the mom, but the daughter was 20 years old and she, they, they, they were having some conflict and because of the daughter's background going through the foster care system and some situations that traumatic situations that she's experienced, the mother was always walking on eggshells and never really called out conflict with her daughter until one night, it all came bubbling up. Because ladies, if you haven't learned, it's gonna come out one way or the other. It, it, you can hold it in until you are blue in the face, but that thing's gonna come out. And it's gonna, and, and many times when we hold it in, that's when it doesn't really come out the best. Because you feel like you've been sparing this person <laughs> and it's just like, you know what? Let me tell you something. Last year when you walked in the house and you didn't take your shoes off, I didn't say anything that time. I sat here, I was quiet. And then two years ago when I picked you up and I didn't have any gas, you know, and it's just, they're just like, wait a minute. That, that much you've been holding on to. So, um, she talked about that. She talked about, um, you know, what happened as she's sitting at this table and she was, she just let it all out. She expressed her emotions. She expressed hurts. She expressed frustrations. Um, and at the end of it, now in this situation, the daughter got really, really quiet and all the mother could think was, I done ruined this relationship. This is it. She hasn't trusted anyone her whole life. And now she's not going to trust me. And her daughter sat there in silence. And the first thing that finally came out of her mouth, she looked at her mother 
after her mother expressed all this stuff. Now, I know that this may not be how it always ends because I know that's a lot to take. It's a lot for someone to take. And I've been here with my husband, child. I, oh, you know, and he's like, what? You know, you ain't tell me that. And I'm like, well, I, hold on. Let me pull out my notebook. <laughs> and God's like, uh-uh, you can't do that. Time passed, Nick. You cannot pour out everything you've been waiting or holding back because finally it topples over. It's not fair. Is that many? And you know what's frustrating if I had that conversation with my husband? Most of it, he don't remember. He's like, I came in the house with my shoes. I had red shoes. And now I'm mad. You don't remember you came in the house with them shoes on? Yeah, they was red. I bought you them for Christmas. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, and then you get more frustrated because the person says, well, I, I don't remember doing that to you. I don't remember saying that to you. So how can we really resolve things here? So the mother and this daughter, the mother unleashes all this stuff. She shares her everything. And I'm sure she, because maybe as a mother, in some ways she did it still in a motherly love, but she, she says some things that were hard. And the daughter sat there and it got quiet. And the first thing that came out of her mouth was, I feel really loved. And the mother was obviously so taken aback. Because she did not expect that. And the daughter just burst into tears. And she said, everything that I've done that you're expressing in this hurt, I've never heard anyone be honest with me like that, which shows me that you really care. It shows me that you are passionate about me. It shows me that you were willing to take the risk to make things better. And it showed me that any time that I've done anything that it mattered to you. Some people will just do things because they don't think you care and you don't ever speak up. And many people in their lives don't ever tell them a thing, especially when we think about maybe some of our, our uh, youth or, you know, they're just like, well, I'm going to keep wreaking havoc because no one ever puts me in my place probably because they don't care. If you notice, even in the school system, some of the toughest, most, how can I call these kids a nice name? Some of the most, you know, hard-headed, blessed kids will grow the best relationships with the one who decides to, to discipline them in love and be real with them and say, you know what? Consequence, but I love you. And now I'm going to pour some wisdom and I'm going to take some time and I'm going to show shout out to our educators and our youth workers and, you know, uncles, aunts, nieces, godparents, because, you know, even me, I grew up with both my parents. I've been blessed. Um, but and when I turned into a youth, I started running to the mentors in my life. I don't want to go, I don't want to say everything to my parents. I needed to talk to my mentors, my coach, you know, and God bless the ones that are able to discipline and be honest because, it does hit differently, even as we get older. When people are able to sit with you and have an honest conversation, it is, <laughs> someone said nice choice of words, exactly. You know, it is a telltale sign that they care. When someone's willing to come to the table with you and vice versa, it is a telltale sign. And I know what happens even on our end sometimes is, it's really hard to receive the truth and love, even about yourself. So while you're sitting at that table and someone's giving you some truth and love, so many defenses are jumping up. So many guards are coming up and we need to learn to start to train our ears to receive the meat, spit out the bones. Sometimes God will allow you to interject and say, no, I don't think that's the way. Because, you you know, pastor has taught us if we fail to define ourselves, we will allow other people to define us. So I'm not saying to sit there and just allow someone to define you incorrectly, but we have to be able to take accountability for the things that we've done, said, and made people feel. You may not think that it made someone feel like that, but they felt it. And that's the point. You may say, well, I just... You know, the sensitivity, the sensitivity levels that we deal with are, are completely different. So you may think that if, well, if that person said it to you, I wouldn't have been offended, but that's not what it's about, right? But we have to be able to share that truth and love. She was able, if she was able to show her passions and it showed a commitment to their bond. 
right? To be able to speak the truth in love shows a passion, a love, and a commitment to bond. Think about that. Jesus walked around <laughs> talking to the people and running into women and men who knew daggone well they wasn't doing right. And he spoke the truth in love constantly. And it was the very fact that someone would call that woman out at the well to say, where are your husbands? You know, thirst no more. And it brought them to tears that someone would take the time to be honest, to show passion, to show commitment that she was valuable enough, even in her sin, for someone to say, that's not right. I got you. I love you. I'm here for you. This is what people need from us today. That in someone's fault, we can go to someone and say, man, what you're doing is not right. I got to be honest. You know, it's just not what God, I see so much more in you. Someone calls it the sandwich. Daniel calls it the sandwich. I don't see nothing wrong with the sandwich. He says, oh, there go the sandwich. You know, you, you let someone know the bread. You are so amazing at what you do. You just communicate so well. And we love the way you present, you know. And then when you spoke to that lady the other time, I think it was, you know, I just think she wanted to be heard. And maybe sometimes that gift of communication that you have, you can just put it to the side so that you can genuinely listen to someone else, you know, but you rock with what you're doing. And somebody <laughs> I would be like, huh, thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, that sandwich can throw you for a loop. You just throw that meat right in the middle. Now, sometimes the sandwich is okay. Sometimes maybe I sandwich way too much, you know, but it's like, who taught me, uh, Mr. O a long time ago taught us everybody needs a different package. Some people can take that uh, a different package lunch. So some people can take that sandwich and for some people you have to package it differently. For some people, when you, when you give them a sandwich, they start looking at you like, okay, what are you really trying to say? Mm -mm, give it to me straight. Some people think that you are coming, you know what I'm saying? And you got to know who you're talking to and who you're packaging that communication to. So she realized that with her daughter, she waited too long to have the conversation. And when we don't have the ability to speak the truth in love, avoidance causes damage in the relationship and potentially in the person as they continue to carry that same thing that you could have spoken on to other people and other relationships. And, and it's just like, man, you had an opportunity to speak into their lives and maybe reveal something to them. Now, let me tell you something. Not everybody's going to sit there from that conversation and walk away and just completely change up. No, but the seed is planted because at the right time, they're going to try to do the same thing again. And they're going to hear your voice whether they like it or not. God is going to bring to remembrance that I told you that wasn't right. I told you the way that you do that is offensive. I told you that you've got to stop procrastinating. I've told you that you've got to be better with your finances. I sent someone to speak to you about that. I told you that if you're waiting to get to the next step, you've got to handle this first. I told you you've got to forgive. I sent that person to you. Right. So when we're waiting for God to bless us and do things, many times he's sending someone to say, OK, the blessing is coming, but you got to fix this first, because if I bless you now with that thing, then you're going to mess it up. If I take you to this new level or this new relationship, because every new level is going to introduce you to new relationships, you're going to mess that up. You're going to talk too much. You're going to oh, I bless you with that new increase of finances. You're going to mismanage it. You're gonna if you're gonna you're gonna have a, a new job, a new boss, and you're gonna have the wrong attitude. You, so and re, so remember when I brought you that word in truth, and we as Christians are also responsible for speaking the truth in love. That when Jesus did his ministry, that's all he did. It's just so funny, like the Pharisees and everybody was just so mad, and his responses were constantly speaking the truth in love. He's like, well, you know, <clears throat> he heard their thoughts, he knew their heart, he knew what they was thinking, and his response was, let me tell you a story. <laughs> he could have been like, you heathens, you heathens. Now he 
did have a moment of overturning tables, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> no, you know what? He needed to package it that way in that moment. He will tell you this ain't right and still show love. Sometimes those conversations are going to be a little turntable. They're going to get a little intense. One of our counselor, marriage counselors told us with me and Daniel, and we said, yeah, when we get into these conversations, he said, yeah, they're called intense times of fellowship. <laughs> I said, I know that's right, because that's intense. As long as you don't miscall someone out their name, disrespect them, you give opportunity to listen, it could get a little turntable-y for you. Those, those, those conversations of speaking the truth, and I'm speaking to you because maybe you're in a situation where you're going to wind up having to speak to a family member and give some honest truth, a friend, and speak some truth and love, a boss, and speak some truth and love, a coworker, and speak, it gets sticky, but God will say Okay, I'm ready for change, but you're the catalyst and I need you to have this conversation and it makes it, let me tell you one thing. Let me tell you something about, let me tell you something about 2024 and I know my, um, my, uh, my slightly older sisters in here can minister because we didn't always have text message. Okay. I know, right? Exactly. Let me tell you something about text message. <laughs> Be careful. I am, I am, I almost said the, the word victim, but that's not the word I'm looking for. I am, um, gosh, what's the word I'm looking for? I am, I, I lost my word, but I definitely fall into that pot where it's easier to have these long texts than to communicate. Oh, I will write you an entire, <clears throat> hey, <laughs> wait, let me, let me give you the whole visual because y'all know I got to give it to you. <clears throat> hey girl, thanks so much for letting me know how you feel. There are a few things that I see about, <laughs> and you know, what's crazy is, and I'm not judging. I'm just, God has been like, you, you need to learn how to communicate <laughs> emojis, emojis. <laughs> Janice said emojis give emotion. Do they not? Because there was a time where it was like, well, you can't understand the tone. Well, let me just put the little blush face. Then we're all good, right? <laughs> LOL. You know, if I put LOL, that lets you know that it's light. It's a light conversation. Like, hey, I know when you said that to me, I was kind of hurt. LOL. <laughs> you know? And so, and, and that and that goes for email. Anything that has taken us away from learning how to, it's a different exchange. I really shout out to, um, uh, my cousin one time, she was like, no, not only do I want to get on the phone with you, let's FaceTime. You know, we don't live in the same states as everybody. And I was so ministered by that because it's a different exchange. Let me tell you something. When you look at somebody in the eye, you will have a different tone. First of all, love precedes that personal connection, right? <laughs> yeah. An argument via text message, forget it. Forget it. Me and my husband have learned the hard way, like, uh-uh. I said, I know you ain't texting me that. Let me come on down the hallway. <laughs> you know, um, when you look into someone's eyes, you're not going to be as quick. What do they call them? Tr uh, they said Twitter fingers become trigger fingers because people will say things differently in a text that you would not say to someone if you saw their eyes. Let me tell you, there's something different when you are spirit to spirit with someone, meaning I can see in your eyes and you can see in mine. I'm not going to disrespect you or, you know, the same way that I might be bolder to say certain things in a text. If you notice when you start speaking to someone and it's a difficult conversation, you slow down because you're like, is this going to come out? You know, in a text message, it's quicker to be like, yeah. So when I saw you do that, it just wasn't cool. And then the other person is just reading it in their own way. And when I saw you do that, it wasn't cool. I'm like, oh. <laughs> you know, especially if you love to read books, me, I over animate everything. So I'm reading the text like a story. So if I feel like you're already mad at me, that's how I'm reading the text. Hey girl, I do not like the way that you saw me and moved along. She ain't even saying it like that, but my head is. <laughs> that, that's me. So remember when you're texting someone and they, the, the response is da, 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 cut it. Especially some, some, some text, obviously can be, technology has become a blessing because look at us today. Look at the chat ministry, right? Okay, 
but we have to remember not to replace it with personal connection. It's like that movie Wally, if you guys saw that, and it was like the future, 2099. Everyone was operating from a chair and you could do everything from a chair. And if you wanted to see someone, you had the birth. And isn't that crazy? Wally came out before the Oculus and all that. I'm not going to get into no conspiracies. I try to stay away from stuff like that because I'm just like, you know what? Thank God Jesus is Lord. I'm sure there's a lot of crazy things going on out there, but I'm glad I know the Lord. <laughs> you know, I don't need to, I don't need to uncover the conspiracies. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure God said there's a scroll that locked away. There's things that we just don't know, but I don't, you don't want to ever get too carried away with stuff like that, you know, but it just made me think. And I was like, well, yeah, the way that we're headed, we're getting less personal. Anytime Jesus performed a miracle, he touched someone. The woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of his garment. She didn't send the bird with the with a piece of dove in the side. No, she said, if I could just touch him, those friends said, if I could just lower the mat in his presence. So there's something about being in the presence of people when you're having a hard conversation. Give them the respect and the benefit of the, the doubt to connect spiritually. And I can guarantee you that that conversation will be much more successful than a text or even an email. Okay, you know, yeah, yep. Janice said, I deliberately make sure to call and FaceTime. Yeah, and I'm the one that gets scared. You know, it's like you send a text and the person sends it back. And send, send a text. And then the more, mature, the more mature person says, this ain't really working because I could see, I could see the tone. And then the phone rings and I'm just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, and I'm just like, <clears throat> Hey girl, now everything changes. The tone changes in the text. I was like, but I don't understand why you said it like that. Phone rings. <clears throat> girl, you see that? Just warmth immediately. Because you ain't gonna, you know. Now with my husband, I might be like, hey. But if there's still, it's different. When me and my husband speak face to face about a conflict versus on a text, different. As much as I try to be like, Hey, what's up? I can't even do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Me and my brother have this thing where when we look at each other, we start laughing all the time. It is very difficult. I don't know what that is. It's, I don't know. Anyway, so avoiding these hard conversations causes damage and allowing us to get caught up in the age of social media and um uh, and technology, we have to be careful with that. There is a way to face, there's a way to still see someone's face, even if you can't physically be in the room with them. Okay. And, um, yeah, and that's what she even said. And even social media, the, this technology and the social media, what it's done is it's allowed us to become harder, hardened hearts, colder, judgmental, Social media is just showing all these good, nice pictures. It ain't showing what the rest of my day is looking like. So, you know, or, or whatever I'm posting. So you could just look at this un this, this non incomplete view of somebody's life. And it allows us to be more impersonal and judgmental based off of what they're presenting. Right. And so I love this. We get speak the truth in love from Ephesians 4:15. Speak the truth in love. And what I call these are special ingredients. Why are these special ingredients? Because many times we can um, be an expert in speaking the truth without love. Or we can be an expert in speaking love and omitting the truth. Mm-hmm. Just be like, well, I ain't going to say it. <laughs> if he ain't going to say it, I ain't going to say it. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> And I think this is so key. It's like when you're baking bread or there are certain things out there that if you miss one ingredient, the whole meal is messed up. And communication can be just as fickle. If you are not sure, everything in the Bible, God is very intentional about what he says. He said, speak the truth in love. That is the whole recipe. Okay, so I really love that. And 
Um, I love, so she, she did a little exercise to see if you might be doing the same. Read the following statements and notice if they rang true for you too. Number one, when I'm frustrated, I try to get just to get over it instead of working through it with the other person. I put an asterisk next to that one after I read them all. That is absolutely me. I do. When I get frustrated, I'm done. I just get done. You know what I'm saying? I'm just like, okay, <laughs> my husband can't stand Oh, when I say that, you know? Okay, because he knows like that's me just being done. I don't, you know? Number two, when I'm hurt, I hold it inside rather than risk being vulnerable with the other person. Mm hmm. That's another one. Right. Because like if I'm already hurt and now I'm going to come to you again, what for you to hurt me again? Absolutely not. You know, so <clears throat> another one, I build up resentment because I think the other person should know what they've done without me needing to tell them. I take the badge of honor for that. But what you mean why I'm mad? We don't even really need to have the conversation because I know you know that I know that you know that I know that you know what you did. Okay? That's me. The badge is mine. <laughs> yeah. What we talk about? You knew how you said what you said. You knew what you did. So I struggle with that, right? We just know the person should know. The other one, I sacrifice my own needs in the relationship because I'm afraid expressing them will inconvenience or distress the other person. Mm. You are more concerned about how speaking the truth in love will make them feel. I have the unrealistic, ex the last one, I have the unrealistic expectation that a strong long-term relationship can exist without conflict. So you just never bring it up. And what that leads is, again, damage. And it can start with minor damage. Then the damage can become more. And then it becomes more. And some people just tolerate that. And so I love that when she talks about just a few verses after Paul tells us in Ephesians to speak the truth in love, he also says, so stop telling lies. Because when you're not sharing something with someone, yeah, um, it's lying. If you're gonna just speak speak in love and hold back, then where what what do they say? Um, either telling a lie or omitting the truth is the same thing. So very, very keenly in that verse it says, stop telling lies. Stop letting people believe that's okay. Stop letting people believe you're okay. Speak the truth in love. And also, when we go to speak the truth in love, one thing I have to learn too is that we can't go in with the expectation that you are going to share and teach and this person is going to walk away learning what they done did so they will never do it again. You have to be able to still speak the truth in love with a teachable spirit. Because one of the things I learned in some of the best conversations is I go there to share my truth and love and I might learn a thing or two. I might find out. I might get some truth and love in return. But sometimes when we go to speak the truth and love, we're already so geared up and so guarded and we practice what we were going to say and the response just throws us off. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Thank you so much for saying that. It's just that you know, when you came out and you showed this and you went to that person and told her that really offended me. So I just, and you're just like, oh shoot. I didn't even realize that I, that, that, when I did that, that, that offended her, which then ripple effect and caused her to do what I was bringing to her. And then some of us stay on that defense. Like, yeah, no, I didn't mean to do that, but what you did. Right. So then we, we don't take accountability. So we have to be able to go to speak the truth and love to people with a teachable spirit and ready also to potentially take accountability, accountability. Okay. That's a humble place. If I could just wrap that up, that is a humble place. Right. And that's why it says to speak the truth in love. Because what does love mean? Love is to benefit someone else at the expense of yourself. So if you're going to speak the truth, you can speak it, but you have to go in there with the choice to love someone so that if the successful uh, result 
of that conversation means that you're going to have to bite your tongue or repackage because you're going to hear the Holy Spirit say, ah, 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 slow down. You said what you had to say. You need to apologize. Yeah, I know you didn't come. You thought you was coming to lay the law. And now I'm asking you apologize in return. We don't, we don't, we're not ready for that part. So there is a whole, um, there is an ingredient to the, the result coming out. Now, sometimes the person on the other side just may not be happy at the end of that conversation. And sometimes you have to know when to just end the conversation. They don't always have to be happy, but do your best to end the conversation in love. That goes back to that sandwich. Hey, I understand. No, no worries. I just wanted to share my heart and I, you know, in no way did I want to offend you, but I just wanted to share my heart and just know that I love you. And I hope that we can continue to have these honest conversations and, you know, be blessed. <laughs> I'm chuckling because Lord child, I wish I sounded like that. That's why I'm chuckling. That's why we need to practice. huh? And this goes all the way back to the, the, the side word that God inserted change. If you're looking for change, if God is calling you to change, many times it comes with these uncomfortable conversations. And many times if he's asking you to be the catalyst of the change you're praying for, you've got to be ready to go when he says go and to speak when he says speak. And sometimes we practice and we practice and you can practice, but guess what? He will also give us the words to say. Right. So I have gotten into conversations with my little speech. But again, when you get face to face with someone, that thing can go right out the window. You might get angry all over again. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So be encouraged in, um, you know, what God is doing in your life. And I love how she says, she says, one reason many of us struggle with more direct communication is because we've been told it's not okay to be angry, right? Going back to how we were raised and how we grew up. But in the very next verse, Paul says in Ephesians, same chapter, Ephesians 4, don't sin by letting your anger control you. Anger is actually a useful emotion. It tells us when something we value is being threatened. It's a great messenger, but a terrible boss. Loved it. Loved it. Anger is not, anger becomes sin when we allow it to control us. It's, he's, it literally says, don't sin by letting anger control you. And he doesn't say that anger will never come. So sometimes we get angry and we just feel like, oh, I got to get this out. I got to get this out. No, just allow it to be the messenger that, man, something's off. I'm angry, um, but that won't be my boss. You know, my favorite verse, don't follow those feelings. Let those feelings follow you and eventually they'll catch up. I'm sorry, not my favorite verse, my favorite quote by Joyce Meyer. Um, eventually those feelings will catch up, okay? you. So you go forward with, I mean, think about it. You're angry and you're speaking to someone in truth and love. <laughs> that is definitely um, allowing your feelings to follow you. Because you may sit down and you're so angry, okay? So it's a great messenger, but a terrible boss. We need to learn how to redirect and direct those feelings. And Paul gives us further instructions by adding, don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. And I love how she said this, because I used to actually always think this. She said, I don't believe this is a literal time limit. And you know, Pastor has taught us that not everything, everything in the Bible is literal or figure, um, figurative. Or a metaphor. I don't believe this is a literal time limit. Sometimes a good night's sleep is essential to effectively addressing conflict. I believe that. But I do believe that when you lay down and if there's still something unresolved, get God in those thoughts. Get God in those thoughts. Go to the work. Because sometimes you may not always resolve it at the end of the night. I know about me. My bedtime is in about an hour. I get sleepy at nine o'clock. Okay. Okay. And sometimes you get more tired, the frustration can build. So I've learned that again with my own husband or even just dealing with people, you know what I'm saying? And so you want to be sure to get God in those thoughts when you are frustrated at night. Sometimes I'll just put on a podcast. I'll look for a subject that I'm dealing with, I'm struggling with, and I will fall asleep to those words. Wake up refreshed, go back to God and look to resolve the issue. Feeling, um, feeling refreshed and ready 
but don't let what makes you angry go unresolved. And then again, continuing in Ephesians 4, anger gives a foothold to the devil because the longer you allow anger to stay, again, you're allowing it to start to, um, what's the word? I'm, I'm going, I'm losing words today. And you are allowing it to almost, um, gosh, what's the word I'm looking for when you, why am I losing words today? Pray for me. But when you, when anger gives it, when you allow anger to sit there, it allows a song to just start to play. And then another song, and then you get this playlist of anger, an angry playlist. So anger gives, and we talked about this in the beginning of WCW, when we talked about resetting those playlists, but the longer you let angry, then the enemy is able to get in there and he is allowed to turn on that angry playlist and it, it can get crazy. And we've been there. We've been there. Okay, so um, rather than stay silent in fear and resentment, learn to speak the truth in love. So she gives us three steps that can help us to do that. Number one, and we kind of talked about this, when you're going to speak the truth in love, identify the expectations. Remember, you may go in there thinking that this conversation is going to go one way, but prepare yourself in love to receive, to, to, to learn and to potentially just walk away and potentially offer your apology and be ready to release it, right? If you're going to resolve it, resolve it. In that conversation, some other things may come up that might try to get you to go deeper. I've come here to share this. I don't want to make it work. You got to be able to reel it back in and release it, especially if the other person is not willing to meet your expectations. Now you know moving forward how to deal with them, right? You manage your expectations. You shift them. Number two, address issues as they come up. Don't allow things to go. You may not be angry, but when you allow that, because you may actually go, oh, that, that, that angered me, but I just never said anything. And now I'm good. And, you know, da, da, but as you let things get, yeah, somebody's saying, I'm getting up in this chat ministry. Yes. Nana Benice is in here. We should always pray prior to approaching. Sometimes God will silence you or give you the right timing and the right words to bring about positive change. Amen. Yes. Cicely says this chapter is speaking the truth. Speaking the truth in love is a challenge indeed. Whilst taking account accountability and being teachable at the same time, it takes so much practice. Amen to that. Yes, festering. Sharon and Shanette said, fester, don't let it fester. Address it. Address it. Because it'll fester and it'll, it'll, it'll fester and it'll build up other things that you can't even see. And lastly, number three, as we close, relentlessly be for each other. I love that. I love that. Relentlessly be for each other. Meaning, again, back to what love represents. You are going there to speak the truth in love. Ultimately, to find a place of resolving and share and even giving that love. You're speaking truth, but you got to give love. You got to be for each other. Be for the relationship. Even if that means after that relationship, access changes boundaries are set up, expectations are managed. That's fine. <laughs> that is fine. You know what I'm saying? But as long as you are still for the person, I love that. Yes. Relentlessly. You know, I love that. She said it like that. The issue is what we're up against, not each other. What we're up against is the enemy that's constantly coming to try and divide and destroy and separate and tear down. That's what we're up against. So when we come into these conversations and we can remember that we don't fight against this fleshly person on the other side, but against uh, the principalities in the air and the things that the enemy is trying to get in, we have to remember that. Um, so it, it, it helps you with that practice. Every time you put that at the forefront, you are reminded to do things differently. And what does she say here? She said, I'm learning that sometimes the most dangerous choice we make in our relationships is to settle for being nice. Niceness often comes from fear. Kindness comes from love. Mm. 
So you can still speak to someone, but be kind. Um, so as she closes, as followers of Jesus, we are being called to the ladder, being kind. So number one, may God grant us the courage to have hard conversations. I don't know what this season is coming for you all. When we meet again, when we have our open forums, let me know, please, or share with me. Just reply to one of the WCW emails. Let me know so I, I'll share with the group. Number two, may he give us the inner strength to be vulnerable with each other. Because that's the place right there, right? And we have to remember that though we're being vulnerable with each other, God is holding your heart. God is holding, no one can, no one can weapon, throw a weapon at you and it'll prosper. Being vulnerable simply means to love someone, to share someone, and it might hurt whatever their response is, but God's got your heart. Number three, may he help us trade resentments for life-giving, honest relationships. Those are the best relationships. And to have people that you know you can trust because you also know you can be honest. Those are the best relationships you can grow with that you've hurt each other. Hurting each other, that's inevitable. Are you kidding? You could think you love someone so much and at some point you might say something or do something that hurts them. Because once, what do we say in the beginning? We're all in different seasons. We can't expect because you're, you're in a season of sunshine and I'm in a season of rain that sometimes we may communicate differently and you may not know why. Um. Number four, may he even use our anger as a sacred healing force in this world. I don't know if y'all see it all over the news and in social media. <clears throat> as far when it means to be the salt and light of the earth, it means to go out and speak like Jesus spoke, to speak the truth, but in love, to be able to be vulnerable, but to also be kind, to be able to be teachable and accountable, to be able to be humble and apologize, to be able to step back and share what Jesus shared. We are literally representing him, walking like he did in this earth. And lastly, may he empower us to sit together and speak the truth in love. So the Lord gave us a little double word on tonight. <laughs> he started us off with, with change and, and how change is constantly happening, how people are in different seasons. And a lot of us need to learn that if he's calling you to make a change in your life, Many times that will come with some hard conversations, but understand it. And it may seem sometimes like I know if, you, if I'm faced with a difficult conversation, it seems very overwhelming. Like someone said earlier that I need to practice, but that's where our faith comes in, right? You think about it, you are know, like, oh my gosh, am I going to lose my mind in this conversation? This person going to make me angry all over again? Child, what should I bring to this meeting? Do I need a weapon? <laughs> you know, you just don't know. But the thing about, and, and uh, Nana Bernice said that, we have to trust that God will give us the words to say. God will tell us when to stop speaking. God will let us know timing. So he will make sure, because see, God knows when somebody's season. So God knows when to, that's why I said, you got to first be released that God is even sending you to speak the truth in love. Okay, some of us are too too ready to speak the truth in love, but people ain't ready for it. And sometimes God will send you to someone at the right time. And sometimes he's saying it's not the right time. And you may not understand why not now, but you don't know what season they're in. You don't know what they're going through. And he will send you at the perfect time when for some reason there is a, a, a openness and maybe even a need to hear what you have to say. So I, I pray that you guys receive something for tonight's message. I will be sending it out in the email tonight so that you can listen to it again, just in case you have to have some hard conversations or for those that are ministered to, because God is about to do a change in your life. And he's asked you to be the catalyst of that change. Be encouraged, be bold, be courageous. Trust God that he's got you. Amen. Chat ministry, yes. Relentlessly be for each other. Amen. Yes, Nana, Nana Bernice, I practice first apologizing. I'm, I may not be apologizing for what I said or what I did, but for the mere fact that he or she was offended. Mm. This way of apologizing can sometimes soften their heart and give you the opportunity to explain yourself with further hurt or conflict. 
Oh, that is so true, Nana. Oh, that is so true. I have learned that even when I don't even know sometimes, I start off, I just want to apologize. It just does something. It sets a humbling. It just welcomes in the presence of God. What is the presence of God? The presence of God is Jesus who came to this earth as a man. That was the first sign of humility. So when you immediately um, start something with humility, you're bringing the presence of God into the conversation. You are initiating it. Sometimes starting with prayer, maybe some people you can't, whatever, you start with prayer. But I love how she said, go in there and humble yourself. Before you get to, I just want to say that, you know, you just did, the way you start something <laughs> will determine the way it finishes, right? So I thank you for that. Yes, 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 amen, amen. Thanks for staying on 807, ladies. We're going to woo sigh out. Um, we're going to pray out. Father, thank you so much for your message on tonight. Thank you so much that seasons come and go and that um, change is the only constant in life next to you, Lord. We thank you that you are always the same. And as you call us to the hard conversations and to speak truth and love, allow us not to overthink it. Allow us not to um, set it aside. Allow us to trust you that if you released us to speak to someone, that all we need to do is go in with humility, with truth, and with your love at the forefront. Give us the courage, oh God. Give us the wisdom and give us the words to speak. Bless every woman that needs to have any type of a hard conversation this week as you are taking her to a new level in her life, oh God. Give her the courage and the confirmation of everything that she needs and the tools that she needs to go into that conversation successfully and come out even more successful than before she went in. And successful meaning healed, whole, and free, oh God. Free to move forward and resolve in the issue in her heart. So I thank you for forgiveness even raining down in our hearts right now towards people because Lord, we don't want unforgiveness to get in the way of the purpose that you're calling us to. We don't want not being able to have the hard conversations to get in the way of what you're calling us to. Have you called us to be lights and salt in this entire world? So let us not hinder the next chapter of our lives. I pray for protection and peace of every woman here. Thank you for tonight. We love you. We honor you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.